Hey Sid, how you doing? Hey Melanie, great thanks and yourself. I'm alright, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I'm sorry about last night. We had untold drama here with our internet. Uh, we've had so many DS server attacks um, in the last month or so. It's been a bit chaotic. But um, thank you for your time. And most importantly, um, thank you for what you're doing. And I really want to learn a little bit about you and your story because one of the most amazing things I'm learning about all these wonderful people I've met um, particularly come together in South Africa and doing this is they all have such interesting stories. So I'm after yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if mine is quite as interesting. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. <laughs> I, I think mine, mine grows very much out of the last 15 years where I've studied a lot about uh, society and uh, our history and everything in general. And it led really to the point where I became quite disillusioned with civilization as it is. And uh, from, from that, you know, when, uh, when we started up the eco-community, I decided, well, I'm actually going to opt out of society. Um, unbeknownst to me that uh, two months after moving to the farm, I met a fellow by the name of Dr. Johan Jebeer, who had just started the Free Man Movement. So I did some study into that. I became involved. I then went and uh, tested out the system to determine jurisdiction. And this I did by changing my number plates, putting uh, a license disc on that said exempt from levy. I was subsequently uh, pulled off probably around 10 to 15 times by various policemen and was confronted by three different traffic chiefs from three different jurisdictions who eventually proved to me that uh, jurisdiction does exist within law because uh, the last the last time was one of the traffic chiefs that drove out on the highway by 20 kilometers to come see me because I refused to get out of my car and he was standing at the window swear, swearing at me and threatening to get the police out to come and haul me out of my car and arrest me because I wouldn't get out of the car and step into his jurisdiction and he actually used those words. So from that I also realized that, you know, I do support the free man movement um, in principle, but the by just, uh, by just letting people do these things, they're stepping un into, into a domain that they know nothing about. Mm. And they can very easily land up in jail or, do in, or, or have uh, injury bestowed on them. This is, the, this is the problem with being free. I think I then stopped doing that because of the uh, realization that to be free firstly takes place in your mind and secondly, it comes with a whole lot of responsibility. People think free. Okay, free needs to be needs to be defined, and it also means that everything you do, you are accountable to yourself and to the, the people around you, and you are fully responsible. So it means you cannot now drive fast because you can endanger the lives of others. You can't just go and beat somebody up because you are accountable for your actions and you can be held accountable for your actions. It goes back to the, to, to natural law, I should say. And of course, then with that, we started uh, discovering a lot more about the, about the financial systems in the world. And from, from that uh, grew New Era and all the work that Scott Cundley is doing with New Era. And at the same time, I, met Michael Tillinger and he was very, he was busy at the time getting the petition together for his Ubuntu party. And well, here we are now with the OPPT and we've got a whole lot of these groups of people doing things. But I really became quite reclusive on the farm for the last couple of years where I would literally really, you know, spend not more than an hour or two a week talking to people. I withdrew from society, but I did continue researching. 
And I came to the eventual conclusion, you know, with all these people out there doing things, most people think that we cannot make a difference. But, you know, just being on these databases, paying attention to what is going out there, learning, um, we have a growing number of people around the world doing things, as you, uh, and the same with you. I mean, I think you've been doing it a lot, a lot longer actively than I have. When did you I start, really, Stan said? When were you actively yes. starting this sort of thing? Sorry? When did you actually st actively start this? Well, I, I started working on it about uh, a couple of months ago. Because what I, what I looked at was the jurisdiction. What are the things that are actually keeping people enslaved? Why, why are things not changing? Why are they not able to change? And from the experience through all the new era court cases that I've been observing, and again now from the OPPT, mm. one can clearly see that there are basically the factors of money control, and you've got uh, jurisdiction control. And the governments and the powers that be that belong to these fiction organizations or corporations that are really just actually paper documents have been granted over the years legal rights. They have been given uh, the right over the people that actually created them. <laughs> and are we going to change? Why do, why do they keep on ignoring these things? I, I, I admire the work that Heather has done and all the other people that have come before. But ultimately, we have to take away the, the ability for government to deny what is actually going on. And this is why I got started on this now, looking at the jurisdictions as well and the laws, because there are no laws or facts that can be tried in a court of law. And this is clearly shown when you have a look at how the court cases are tried going through new era. The judges actually ignore the facts, the laws are hypothetical, they're open to interpretation, and they will actually rule according to whichever way they have decided. And they ignore the evidence completely. Then we have people like uh, David Miller with uh, quantum language past syntax grammar, who has mathematically proven that the laws say nothing about nothing. He often talks about uh, no law facts shall be tried the court of law, but this is, people say, okay, now this is the judge's oath. It's not really the judge's oath. It's just that there are no facts within law. And it's a manipulation of the whole legal system in order to keep people enslaved and in order to gain control of, of situations. You also have the situation, if you have two people that are not represented by corporations going into a court of law, yes, you can get some form of justice out of that. When it comes to person against corporation, the corporations will always win. This has been a typical, a typical scenario. And then also looking at the money crisis around the world. I mean, all over, things are collapsing. And people say, no, but, okay, we need, our, we are reliant on paper money, we need to continue that way. But if you go back on the history of paper money to the time of uh, 1,300 years ago when Marco Polo was in China, and there, there they had fiat paper money, through to 1690 in America, where, again, the money wasn't based on anything, but it was just created out of thin air, and to France, twice in the 1700s through to late today uh, Germany in the 1920s we've got current day Zimbabwe and so we have again a monetary system that is based on nothing and every time what bailed out these monetary systems was when they actually based it on gold again and when they linked it to a particular metal or precious metal, I should say. And we are just going down that same tube and everybody everybody ignores it. I, and I listen to things like, uh, you know, you look at, you look at the OPPT. Um, if I look at the world population and all the rest of it, then uh, 
they still represent, although they're growing, but they still represent a certain portion, and the governments and the banks and everybody are just ignoring that. Nothing, they, nothing, nothing concrete is coming from that. So that is where my idea came from, was to notify government about what is actually going on, so that they cannot claim plausible deniability later on. Because if we can create a situation where the people know that they know, then they can't hide hide behind corporation uh, protection anymore. From this, from that moment on, they are now accountable for their actions, whether they like to acknowledge this or not. And that is how I started getting involved with this because I've just been looking at what, what, how can I possibly make a difference in this whole, mm. in this whole scenario? And that is why I've now notified the government. And it's been quite interesting because the document that I sent to government um, about a week or so ago, that has already arrived with them because this morning, in the early hours of this morning at about one o'clock, I started releasing this information to the public for the first time. <laughs> there were only a handful of people that know about it. And when I started releasing it to the public, I then went on, in the document there are particular links giving res reference to certain places like uh, reports that were on Forbes and uh, the Guardian Mail and places like that. And when I went on this morning, there were three of the media companies that had reported on these things earlier where the links have now been disabled. So you go on, it gives, it takes you onto the media company's website and the link's no longer there. And the, the fourth one was with the Universal Postal Union because I showed the connection between the Universal Postal Union and the United Nations. Because again, a lot of our laws and control come through the UPU and the UN. And even on the UPU site, that particular link does not attach. And yet all the other links in the document are still working fine. And this comes down to media control again. And it also shows that the government are now aware of the document. They can't, they don't have plausible deniability anymore because they have actually gone, since receiving this document in the last few days, they have now made sure that those links within my document have been disabled and the people cannot see those actual reports anymore. I do have some of those reports actually on my computer which I will make available again. But this is the devious nature of what is actually going on. And what I'm trying to do here is I know that they will probably not come and talk to us at this point in time. Um, but when we apply enough pressure, eventually they're going to have to. They cannot, they cannot deny the people. They're coming up for an election in April next year. And when the people get to know that they know what is actually going on and they are not representing the interests of the people, um, it now just starts applying more pressure to them to acknowledge what is actually taking place around the world. Yes, they have been foreclosed. But, and they cannot deny it, and they cannot say, well, from this moment on, whatever benefits and privileges they derive, they have, uh, well, the people actually have the right of taking it away from them if they do not uh, come to the table and start negotiating and bringing out, disclosing all these lies that we've been involved or that they have been involved in, and then looking at ways of rectifying that. I so said, let, let's look at South Africa, which to me is the most extreme and obvious example of what is wrong with the planet having the largest gap between rich and poor. Um, we've known for many years, I mean, it's commonly obvious, that, and it's a known fact that South Africa has the most openly corrupt government in the world. They know we know, we know they know we know. Yes. What do you reckon that getting them to acknowledge more liability in the long term is going to do? Well, the mere fact that they know that we now have given them some of this background information so that they can't get away from it. As the, as the movements grow, and they will, because more and more people are actually getting involved. 
And as this as this develops, it's going to force them into a situation eventually where they cannot deny it anymore. And enough people will actually start standing up. You know, we've got we have fifty million people in this country. Sure. Mm. And when I've spoken to I've spoken to a lot of the a lot of the people around the country, um, black, white, coloured, Indian. And you find that a lot of them are starting to acknowledge, yes, life is not becoming easier. Mm-hmm. These are the things that they need to accept. And once they realize what is actually going on, there are trade union movements that can get involved. This is how, this is how they, they started breaking the back of government, of the old uh, apartheid government, was through the development of trade unions. There are ex-activists within the ANC now retired that are very disillusioned with government and don't like what is actually happening. And uh, I mean, it all goes through to our leaders. What example is Jacob Zuma setting to this country? You know, there are, there are moral issues around it that affect the decisions that all our children and stuff one day make. And I don't have all the I don't have all the answers, Mel. But I know that uh, every person that gets involved and that starts creating an awareness can have an impact yes. and does have an impact. Totally agree with that. I know. I mean, I just know just from little old me here at my computer what I've done and the reach that I've had. You know. Yes. So I know just for myself, and I know that if everybody else just put that little bit of effort in, we could absolutely change the world. I mean, I was I was actually dumbfounded by your by your video on the words because <laughs> especially the Australian guy that you'd actually interviewed. Yeah. I could not. I I mean, I'm, I'm fairly open-minded, but I found it difficult to come to terms with the fact that the Aborigine people had been reclassified. As plants. <laughs> you know, so, so that, not reclassified, so they had possible. always been classified up until the 90s as fauna and as, flora. As fauna, yeah, as fauna. I mean, up until, I think you said it was 1988 yeah. when the law was actually abolished, reclassifying them now as humans. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think there are many people around this, around the world that are actually aware of things like that. No. You see, South Africa got it such, such bad, so bad in the international press, which is what I really try to express with my film, is that the, the power of the corporate-controlled media to, to destroy a country, which is what it did to South Africa, because South Africa was nowhere near as bad as what some of the other countries were doing, yet no attention was paid to them. And that was the whole point I was trying to illustrate, is that I'm not saying what we did was right, I'm not saying it was wrong. What I'm saying is that it certainly wasn't as bad as other people, yet we got all the attention. Exactly, and and people that were doing far worse were actually being that 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 was covered up completely, and they were still being supported. Yeah. And why 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 did that happen? I mean, people also look at our our reserve bank system, and they say, well, we're not part of the Federal Reserve. But I mean, all all you have to do is look at some of the some of the some of the excellent things going on there and if you have a look at all the carol quigley i don't know if you've ever read his book yes i have carol quigley professor quigley yeah that's it i mean you look at you look at carol quigley and he clearly shows the links between cecil john rhodes and uh Mulder in the early part of the century and how they were integrate integrally involved and with the, with the uh, development of the Beers and Anglo-American in the 1800s mm. and how that system was then introduced, the Federal Reserve System from America was introduced into Africa. We were the first African country to accept the American Federal Reserve System back in, 19, back in 1921 and then of course the Child Registration Act that came, that came along in 1923. Um, where they knew long, a long time before the fact that they were going to abolish gold. That was a whole. That that was the whole plan. And as early, I mean, America's America's gold standard, I think, was abolished 
1933 with the, with the development of the Bank of International Settlements. And again, the Bank of International Settlements goes back to the uh, OPPT. There they, there they show the clear links around that. And eventually, it is through our birth registrations, we have now become trusts and we are now tradable entities. We are now, we are now, we have now got a corporate identity which the government can now trade through the Securities and Exchange Commissions in Washington, D.C. And the lies are so big that it is very difficult for people to actually come to terms with it, but the, all the evidence is there. And yet uh, it is denied. I think South Africa in 1921 was only the fourth country outside of uh, the European countries in America that um, introduced the central banking system. And that was a private enterprise. What gives private companies the right to control our monetary systems and our lives? Mm. And, you know, withdrawing, withdrawing money, people, a lot of, a lot of economists are taught in our educational institutions, you all know, the, the cycles of um, recession and so on are, these are, these are cyclical, but they're not. They are actually instituted by withdrawing money out of circulation, um, creating a recession, and then after that, it, it puts a lot of companies in trouble and that gives them the ability to start buying up those companies. And even so, it's not about owning everything, it's about controlling. How do you control? Mm. That is how all of these things have come about, is, uh, which is clear from the, and that's another report that went missing on, the, on this document. Where I, did a, where I did a hyperlink on that document is the report where they talk about Harry Oppenheimer control you know, controlling Anglo-American with only 8% of the shares. Mm. I then also mentioned guys like uh, James B. Gladfield, who is a Swedish scientist, and he with a team of other guys used supercomputers, and a couple of years ago they came out with a report that showed, I think it was, it was around 80 or 87% of the world's wealth was controlled, not owned, but controlled by 1,318 companies. And that these companies were controlled by about 147 companies which had a vested interest in each other. So when people start looking in the right places, they find the right answers. And I mean, with our fiat paper currency at the moment, Every single one, historically, every single time fiat paper currency has been introduced, it has actually failed. But it has given people control of certain things. It has given certain uh, minority or exclusive groups control over these things. So, yes, I, I look at these things and all I can say is I can only do the best of it to my ability yes. and try and make this public and uh, try and get the government into a position where they have to be held accountable. Mm. I, I absolutely admire that and um, think that's definitely the right attitude to have. I think on a, the practical uh, reality of it is, having done this for some time, Sid, I mean, I've, I've, not, I've been understanding Freeman Law for like over four years now and I've seen people come, I've seen people go and I've seen people try all sorts of things. The reality is, is that um, a government is bought and paid for by powers outside of our country. Who they are is up for debate. I discussed in my documentary. They are never going to change because they themselves have to fulfill a certain agenda that's not decided by them. They're, you know, this, yes. this, this is it. And this is my concern is that it doesn't matter how much pressure we put on them. Ultimately, if they don't do what they're told, they're taken out. Yeah, this is, this is it, but I also feel the fact that um, people don't know what's going on. Yes. Once people know what's going on and the government knows that the people know, it opens the door. That is why I've created what I call an invitation to dialogue. Mm. The, a lot of the ministers, I accept that there are a lot of people that go into government that actually have 
very, very good intentions. Then they land up in government and then the reality hits them. <laughs> well, they find, well, we are not in control. You know, we are actually being controlled and be helpless because all that happens is those that are in control, be it, be it the international banks, be it the, be it the Crown, the Vatican, or whoever is controlling them, they threaten them and say, right, if you don't toe the line, we will remove our banks. We will close our banks, shut down. We'll shut down your economy. Millions of people will die. Okay, that's the, that's, that's the fear what are, that they're going to lose, that everybody will lose, because a lot of their intentions are good initially. Then suddenly they find they are sucked into this corporate control mechanism and they cannot tell the people, they cannot openly, because the media is controlled as well, they cannot openly go, go and tell the people, listen, um, this is what happened, what's happening, we've got a problem on our hands. Um, we are kind of helpless in this situation. By creating, getting to a point where enough people know about it, because people are talking. I mean, I have been, I, I observe these, I've been observing these movements and so on as well. And you can now walk around South Africa and virtually, without fail, you'll find that more than 50% of the population are aware of what the banks are doing. Okay, so that's, that's step number one. Once all these things come out, then it opens the door to government to say, okay, we are enslaved as you are. How can we work together to try and solve this problem? Because alone they cannot do it. By keep on controlling the people, they cannot do it. Yeah. So we have to bring the government and the people together. Because when you look at things like um, the foreclosure of governments and so on, nothing is going to nothing is that's not going to that's not going to change. They'll just ignore that in any case. But when government knows they are not, we are not here to try and prosecute them because of what has been happened. Even Al Zuma, you know, the guy, the, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a strange character. In the, in the freedom fighting days, I suppose he did a lot of good, but then he got caught up in this corporate thing, and now he's um, receiving benefits and privileges from the wrong people. And that's through the control, that's the control that they have on him. But I don't want to look at the situation of punishment. If we start looking at revenge and all the rest of it, mm, nothing, I agree. Will, nothing will ever change. Government need to know that this is about dialogue, it's about peace, it's about finding solutions together and about bringing that information back into public, um, into public perspective, whether that's done through our national broadcaster, SABC TV, we are the people that paid for that. I don't care who, who actually owns <laughs> or controls it at this point in time, but it's the people of this country and their taxes that paid for that. It's the same with inflation. It's not the rich people that are feeding it. Inflation is always affected. Always affects the uh, middle and lower income yeah, groups. For sure. And some somewhere along the line, people have to become desperate enough, or they have to know what's going on. And when that goes on, I don't. You know, the last thing we want is war. Every single yeah. being on this planet needs to be protected. Whether They've been guilty of being manipulated and they're at the head of government or not. Every single person, every life must be must be respected. Yes. And I think this is what we, we need to get to. We need to get to talk. We need to get to dialogue. There is more than enough history written of the world over thousands of years to be able to understand what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, it's like... You get you get all the if you take the if you take the Illuminati structures and the people in control, some of them will say yes, but we want to control because we if we control you guys as slaves, then things will actually work out. This is this is not the case because the planet's been destroyed because of the fiat paper currency. You have to have a continuously growing economy in order to feed uh, the debt that has to be serviced. Mm. Um, if these people claim to be so highly intelligent, why don't they? Because their 
money has been created through the manipulation of people and at others' expenses, at the expense of other people. So everything gets created at the expense of other people. If they claim to be so brilliant, then certainly they can come and sit around the table and they can work out a system where there will always be a win-win situation. If they cannot do that, because I'm not, uh, I don't claim to be of genius um, intellect, but if they can do things like that, then and they are the ones that claim that they are of superior intellect, well then come and sit down and let it will work out something that um, will benefit people and can be instituted for future for future generations. Don't come and say, well, I am superior to you, therefore I need to be in control of you. I mean, the wars have not been fought, have not been instigated by the people. The wars have been instigated by those in control. Yeah. And these are the things that, that need to be looked at. We need to, we need to look at a, a certain amount of bringing a certain amount of philosophy into it and get people to ask questions and get people to start thinking. I personally don't, I, I, I think you're very, very optimistic about the government working together. Uh, looking at the control structures, just, just purely from my own observations and, and research, and I could be completely wrong, they are subservient to the ultimate powers. You want to call them the Babylonian cult, the Roman cult, whoever, the people that ultimately control the world through the Vatican. And the, the simple fact is, uh, he, our current president, Jacob Zuma, has recently been knighted. Nelson Mandela is a knight of Malta, knight of St. John, as was Thabo Mbeki. And the, they actually, if they don't serve these people, they get taken out. That's what happened to Muammar Gaddafi. That is why he was taken out, because he actually did. He turned around and wanted to give Africa a gold-based currency called exactly. the gold dinar. And, they, and he was a knight of Malta. And because he betrayed the oath to serve the Vatican, they killed him. And I just want to, I want to share this with you quickly. It's an extract from George Orwell's book, 1984. And this is the reason why I don't believe the people that control us will ever come together to work with us. I just want to read this to you. It's from a, page 190. It goes, But it was also clear that an all-round incre all increase in wealth threatened the destruction of hierarchical society. In a world in which everyone worked short hours, had enough to eat, lived in a house with a bathroom and a refrigerator, and possessed a motor car or even an aeroplane, the most obvious and most uh, important forms of equality would have already disappeared. If it became general that wealth would be conferred on all with no distinction, it would of course be possible, no doubt, to imagine a society where wealth in the sense of personal possessions and luxuries should be evenly distributed, whilst power remained in the hands of a small privileged caste. But in practice, such society could not long remain stable, for if leisure and security were enjoyed by all alike, the great mass of human beings who are normally stupefied by poverty would learn to think for themselves, and once they had done this, they would sooner or later realize that the privileged minority had no function and they would soon sweep it away. In the long run, a hierarchical society is only possible on the basis of poverty and ignorance. And this is the reason why they keep South Africa poor. Absolutely. I, I agree. And, you know, that is why I think the advent of the internet is such a, a great tool. Yeah. yeah. Because... That is one way of reaching masses of people. And is there a sudden awakening? I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a gradual. And I don't believe that there's going to be some uh, amazing awakening. You know, we're going to wake up one day and everybody's going to know. I don't, I don't, see, that, I don't see that happening either, either. So all that we can do that I can see if is feasible is start to spread the word, chip away, more people that are chipping, the more people will eventually know that they are in power, yes. that they have the power. I agree. Um, in order to now tell government, well, we don't need you or get out of there or we are going to create a structure that cannot be cannot be manipulated in this way anymore. Yes. Well, let me just say that um, having done this, 
for some time. When I first started, I went out to South Africa in 2010 trying to raise awareness. I was like hitting my head against a brick wall. The upsurge just in like the last year and a half of people in South Africa waking up, and it's got a lot to do with the work that Scott and, and, and Michael have done as well. They've raised awareness, but also people coming on to find my work and finding um, work further afield of other journalists internationally, getting on the yes. internet and looking more. What I would say is I at first was also like I was feeling the same way you did for many years, but I can honestly say in the last 18 months I've seen that curve on the graph just suddenly shoot up. And I, I'm more hopeful than ever that we are able to now somehow reach a kind of critical mass where enough of us know the truth for us to actually do something about it and make a difference. And that's exactly it, Mel. It's people like you and Scott and Michael Tillinger and Heather <coughs> and Thea, all of them, that have actually given me the, the insight and... Um, the courage to now step forward and say, you know what, I'm not going to bury my head in a whole aunt society and go and not speak to anybody anymore. <laughs> I'm actually going to come out and I want to, I, I'm going to try and do whatever I can in, to, in order to expand on the knowledge that's out there. Yes. And for sure. And it's like, it's, that's exactly it. I mean, and we know also that there have been people that have been doing this for decades already. Mm. So I do, I have, seri I have a serious amount of hope, um, whether the government come and talk to us or not. Um, I believe that eventually, with all that you're doing and everybody else is doing, we will get to that critical mass that you've just explained that is growing now exponentially. Yes, well, I can see it. I see it in the, in the numbers. The numbers do not lie. The visitors to our site, the numbers of people, more and more people watching our vids than they used to. Also, we get, you know, the YouTube, are, one thing about YouTube, they love their statistics there. Eh? You get a breakdown of which countries are watching and, you know, all of that. Loads more people every month from South Africa. Let me tell you, I'm ever more hopeful. Spoke to Anthea this morning and, you know, I just listened to that woman and, the, and her voice and the way she speaks. Here's this woman, she's going to court on the tent. She's got not an ounce of fear in her. Nothing. She's so, so positive and so vibrant and so enthusiastic that I have to, I have to, something inside of me just goes, you know what? It's because of people like this that I believe, I believe, you know, people like yourself. Enough people come out and say something. It encourages others and gives others hope and that is so important for me more than anything is to encourage others as you said as we've encouraged you you encourage others this is it I mean I had an interesting uh, feedback from a new person that's come on to my journey today mm. and he, you know what what I ask on the journey is you know how can you make a difference and one of the things you can do is just put down the names of three people that you know with their email addresses so that they can link on to the journey and become more self-aware of what is actually going on. And this guy said to me, well, you know, can't I just send you the, the names of the people and then you contact them? And I can also understand people's reluctance because they say, well, I do, do I want my name? But you don't have to, you don't have to be afraid that people are going to think anything of you. This is, this is the other thing I, I wish people would understand. Don't worry about what other people think of you. Yeah, exactly. We've had this discussion yeah. before. I agree, Sid. You know, and I, I often say, I don't bother to explain myself anymore because people believe what they want to anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And this, this, this to me is one of the essence. You know, if you, want, if you want change, if you are unhappy with government, if you are unhappy with the way things are, if you are finding life more and progressively more difficult as the decades go on, you know what? Put your friends' names on the list. Let them participate. Let them judge for themselves whether I'm cuckoo or not. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I tell you, it's not that you're cuckoo. Most, and you know what South Africans are like, and there's a real camaraderie, like you get a group of guys together, and it'll just take one of them to shut your idea down, and they're all calling you cuckoo and mad. And it's not because you're cuckoo and mad, it's because they feel threatened that what you say could threaten their reality. It basically, there could be a potential that what they know is not right. And 
Let's face it, the average South African man um, is still very ego driven. We are still a little uh, unevolved in terms of that. I definitely find there's a schism there between people in South Africa and people in and, and the European men, definitely. But it's the same in Australia. Yeah, there's a real ego based, and it's it's fueled by the beer, Borka, Burwars culture. You know, um, of having to be the man and having to be right, and you know, you don't want to be showing up to be a fool in front of your mates and be wrong with this, and you know. So all you do is, if you are going to look like a fool, you run down the guys making you look like a fool by calling him crazy. Oh, I know the feeling exactly. I was down in, uh, I went and climbed in Drakensberg about eight years ago and I came down to Cathedral Peak and I went to the hotel to have a, to have something cold to drink. And there were a whole lot of guys drinking their beers, talking about rugby and all the rest of it. And I ordered a beer, but I also ordered a Coke. So I don't like just plain beer, I like Coke. It's nice to have a shandy. And uh, the next thing, these guys were just pointing and laughing. Eh? But one guy was actually brave enough to stand up and said, you know what, you like that, so hey, I respect the fact that you're actually drinking it the way you like it, even if you don't drink a solid beer. Eh? <laughs> so, yeah, that whole, that I, whole I, laugh and point so, culture is terrible. It's terrible. I, I've experienced that exact similar situations myself with certain things in uh, you know, restaurants and all sorts. And my, my dad taking the, the sales staff out, all the, the men, all the boys out. Uh, I happened to come and, and join them for a drink. And there they are taking the piss out of a table of Chinese tourists. This is at the Cape Town waterfront. Take, taking the piss out of a bunch of Chinese tourists who've ordered more rice than they could possibly eat. Okay. <laughs> and, and of course, this is what they eat in China. Okay. They eat a lot of rice. So our t the, my dad's t my dad and they they were like pointing and laughing outright and of course having lived abroad I just stood up and I said okay guys it's funny now I'm drawing a line enough and when I did that they they did it more just to get at me because I knew I was bothered by the fact they're being so ignorant and pointing and laughing at people just because they were doing something different to what they were doing like well, something so stupid as ordering more rice you know what I mean uh, yes. Those words are interesting because you are being so ignorant. I mean, who is actually ignorant at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah. We have a, I, we, we still have a long way to go in society. But I think uh, ultimately what everybody is doing is contributing greatly. And I, am, I, I would love to see that exponential curve of yours on, and visitors to your website increase uh, you know, fourfold, and uh, yeah, I think it. What is it? It's uh, Freedom Central dot uh, info. info is it? Yes, it's not. Do you know? I tell you where I've recently seen just how the interest in South Africa is. My film, The Last of the Boers, has been one yes. of the fastest viewed films we've um, pieces we've put out in a long time. I mean, within the first six days, it got like six thousand views. Wow! So for me, again, it's a sign. Yeah. That there is. There is an interest in people in South Africa waking up. But, you know, I've got lots of good documentaries that I've got planned. I said, you're going to love it, actually. I might even use some of your uh, vocal, um, like I did with the other one, in one of them. But I want to I wanted do a documentary about Cecil John Rhodes and that whole Oppenheim, the Oppenheimers. And, you know, you were talking about it earlier, what Carol Quigley talks about. I really want to focus a bit in on that. Um, because there are researchers who touch on it, but you actually have to be from South Africa and passionate about South Africa to put more detail in. Most people just really touch on the Africa stuff, yeah? And I really want to bring this home for people in South Africa. Because you know, when I started doing this research, you know, people say, yes, oh, you know, we've heard about this, we've watched Zeitgeist, we know about the Skull and Bones, we know about the Illuminati, but you know, South Africa's the other side of the world, totally different. I'm like, you know what, that is the most ignorant statement because... To me, South Africa is the most obvious example of what's wrong with the world, with the widest gap between rich and poor, with the securitizations uh, and all the stories going on in the banks. You uh, know? Absolutely. We were one of the first countries in the world to actually go into the system, Yeah. to become part of that. I mean, Rhodes was integral in that. Our gold and our natural resources, gold, diamonds, 
all those natural resources that we used to create and prop up economies in the past. Yeah. A lot of that came out of South Africa. And oh, this yeah. is what people don't realize. We have got a history that is so tied into the existing controls through the Federal Reserve Bank of International Settlements, IMF, World Bank, and all the all the links are there. Everything is the proof is there, the evidence. I was so glad when I saw your movie on the Boers that you actually popped into view good old Harry Oppenheimer and Nicky Oppenheimer because you are guys that are living. I mean, Nicky Oppenheimer is alive today. Anglo, they, these are the guys that are around now that are very much part of this control mechanism. For sure. I've got to do, as I said, I wanted, you know what, my script for The Last of the Boers was double of what I had to cut it down to. And I actually, the only reason I popped those, the guys in there, just briefly, was because I didn't want to leave them out completely. But trust me, I had so much more to say on them. It's a whole new documentary. So I am, I am going to be doing a bit of a sequel to The Last of the Boers, which won't be called you know, a sequel to The Last of the Boers, but it's going to really cover that. And uh, I think, you know, I've been talking to Tina van der Waal, who's homeschooling her kids, and she's been asking me about, you know, syllabuses and stuff for the children and I've always sort of liked the concept of Masi Fundi Sami, the Zulu concept of let us teach one another where you know we, we interview, we research, we create material, we put it online and it's there for our children. You know we're in an age now where we don't have to rely on teachers and chalkboards to educate our children. We can choose material for them to view. Absolutely. And so, then they will follow their own interests. They will expand on their own interests naturally. It's again, it comes down to that uh, the natural law, the, the, the law of natural selection. You know, you choose what are you really passionate and interested about, and that's how you develop. That is how you become and get to do something that you love to do as an adult. Yes, exactly. And I'm so, um, I, I'm absolutely so thrilled that we're in a situation now where we're able to create material for young children to watch and learn the truth and not be fed the garbage and the lies that we were fed in history classes at school. Exactly. I mean, those, <coughs> that's, those are the lessons that we should be teaching our children. Um, and, I mean, the whole educational system, people are so limited by their education. Now, I'm not talking about because you haven't got to, you've only got to stand at six. I'm talking about the people with degrees, because the degrees, again, comes through a lot of the road scholarships. What's taught in universities was what they want us to know, what Rhodes wanted us to know, what Andrew Carnegie wanted us to know. I mean, he was, he was brought out by J.P. Morgan, I think, 1906, and between 1906 and his death in 1919, he spent most of his fortune, and he was bought out at the time for just around $500 million in the beginning of the last century. That's a huge amount of money. He set up education systems and financed education systems in order to let people now control what people are learning. Rhodes has done the same, and this is stuff that needs to be taught. How yeah. do we prevent things like that? That's what we need to look at when we start looking at re-establishing a new system of uh, living. I agree, absolutely. And it starts with us, each and every one of us. Yeah, absolutely, Mel. And um, I am, uh, I'm delighted to now be able to at least participate actively in this, be part of it. Yeah. And I can see, I can see from the, the many, many emails that are coming in since I started my journey over the last couple of days, there are many people now that have started coming on to join it. I mean, today alone I've had uh, potentially 50 people that have joined the journey. Wow, that's fantastic. And, and uh, more coming on as we go along, you know. And, this, 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 is the, this is the power of the internet, and if people can just realize that, that, you know, put the names of any three people that you know on the list, let me email them, and let's see if they're interested in joining the journey, and they do three, and it just goes, it just uh, expands exponentially. And very soon, sooner than you know, we can actually be in a position in this country where we can 
could have educated enough people in order to start uh, doing something constructive for the government. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even if they if they refuse to talk to us, well, someone's going to. <laughs> That's all I. All I can say. Yeah, indeed. Oh, well, I think we're going to leave it this. This has been a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, let's do some more. Um, you know, it's been wonderful just to share an experience, um, your your experience, really, and to get an idea of what it's like on the ground South Africa at the moment. And I just listen to you, and I love your, your very, 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 very South African accent. And I hear the words, and it warms my heart because it makes, gives me hope. And it makes me think, you know what? There are people out there who are getting it, man, and they're getting in my home country, and things, I reckon, they will change. Well, well, thank you, and uh, I can I can just say thank you very much for the for the support that you've given people like myself. I know what you've done for Michael and Scott and so on as well. Yeah, and I think that's invaluable. Even though you are you are South African, you'll that will never change. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? You never take the culture out of me. And you know what? I know it's got it's it's, it's actually when when I'm dancing. You know when I dance and I go out and I go to the nightclub, whatever. I dance and I like. I used to dance with my maid's kids, yeah, with, with, with our, our okay. house cleaners' kids, and the the way they dance, it's still it's a part of my culture. That's that's how I move my body. When I close my eyes, I'm dancing with those little kids again. You know, I, so I dance like I stomp my feet like I'm doing gumboot dancing kind of thing. You know, I do it. I, I dance like a Zulu woman. I'm a white Zulu woman on the dance floor, and people they love it. And I make noises and and I do. I, I just I just do. I let go. And um, you know that's that's Africanness in me. When I when I free myself and just moving around and having fun in the music, what comes out is my African culture. So you know that that African that African culture to me, the people of Africa are amazing. For sure. I have travelled to various countries around Africa. I work with Zulus down in KwaZulu Natal, and inherently they are the most beautiful people. Yeah, we don't we don't need all the. I, I find them much easier to re, to relate to, it. and they are friendly. They are, and all all they need is to be treated and know that they were so cared for. And they they the most amazing they the most amazing bunch. I I haven't travelled outside of Africa for many years, uh, probably twenty more than twenty years now. Every time I go anywhere, I go into Africa. It's, uh, well, it's the land of my birth and uh, mm -hmm. the continent of my birth, I should say, and I love the people there. For sure. Let me just say that, unfortunately, the black people of, of Africa have been made to feel like um, they are unworthy of our love. And yeah. they're not. They're not. They've been degraded and humiliated and detribalized and turned into criminals and rogues because of a society that's sick and has, has not loved them and uh, disrespected their culture, uh, detribalized. You know, I, I understand sometimes why they have this inherent hatred for the white people, but it's not, you know, I think to point fingers at all white people, we're not all bad. Some of us really genuinely are trying to make the world a better place, not just for me, for everybody. You know, that, that's all colors. And um, I, I tell you, when I went home to South Africa in 2010, I have to agree with you. Some of the best times I had was actually talking to the natives and the locals. And I remember I really, this one waiter, this one restaurant I used to go just have coffee and do because they had free internet. And you know, I was chatting to him one day. He's a Zulu guy, and then the next day he he knew I was coming regularly. He bought in his wedding album to show me his wedding photos of how a traditional Zulu wedding looks like. You know. I was blown away. You know, I mean, how many people do that to complete strangers, you know, bringing the wedding mom to show them? But he was so taken by the fact that I was interested in his culture. And I was asking him about, you know, Dr. Kreda Mutu, if he knew him and all sorts. Because at that stage, I was out there with another film, doing another, you know, filming some more documentaries. Okay. So, and that's how I got chanted. And I was, the, the social warmth is something we can really envy in the Native Africans. And it's something that um, they haven't lost, no matter what has been done to them. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So I, I I think this is it. I mean, the one, the most beautiful thing about the native culture is that they are not deceptive. They are they are genuine in what they are, what they feel, how they react. 
they don't try to be something in order to impress. Mm. <laughs> 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 and I, yeah. I, really, I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's hard to find that within the white culture. I'll, I'll tell you what, it's different. Within your upmarket white culture in South Africa, everyone's trying to impress everybody else. Everyone's so worried about what everyone else thinks. And everyone has an external locus of identity where they only value themselves if they're liked by others. It's very sad. <laughs> it's a schism in the psyche of the white South African. It's brought about by MTV coma culture. I'm telling you. And, you, and, for, and, and fortunately, these you know, black people haven't grown up in South Africa, maybe have not been exposed to that much of it because they've not had electricity and whatever else. So they're not tainted by it. You know, yet, you know, we, yeah. the, 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 the sort of more upmarket, civilized, uh, like more, um, you know, affluent white society would look down at them and call them uncivilized, whereas actually it's us. We are the ones who are detached from our humanity. We have become completely, I mean, since when do you put material wealth looks education above that of a human being yeah because this is what this is what's 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 become of our society um i am better than you because i've got more money more i've got a higher education and etc and <laughs> how, can, how can you actually justify that yeah yeah you can't make you better no does it make me happy every time I come out of the gilded mansion that I've been locked behind under Umschlange Rock and I walk into the streets and see these children begging? You know, do I feel better than them because I'm driving in a BMW and they have to scrounge for their food? No. It makes me feel worse. You know? Absolutely. And yet we all, a lot of people, just look the other way. Yeah. It's easier to ignore than to do. But, but how can they? I don't understand how people can look the other way. So I mean, again, the detachment of humanity. But the, yeah. that is drummed into us in South Africa. Think about it. The average South African with money actually probably does look the other way most of the time because the attitude is we can't help them all. There's just too many of them. Exactly. And it's, and it's not true. No. It, is, it just is not true. It starts one by one. And I mean, if we just have a, if we just have a look at government waste, I mean, in you know, 2010, that's another report that went missing, or that they have taken the link off the media, the uh, media's internet site, was uh, the report of our the Auditor General's report of 24.8 billion dollars being wasted by government in 2010. 24.8 yes. billion. I mean, you can feed them out of South Africa for a year on that. Yes, of course. You might not feed them crayfish and stuff, but you can feed them, yeah. Yeah. And, and then we've got kids and people going hungry and going to bed at night. I mean, I had a, I had a kind of adopted kid down in Sudwana, and him and his five siblings, they were at many nights, they would go to bed. Before I came, before I knew about this, they would go to bed on a glass of sugar water. That was it. They had nothing to eat. Oh. But they could go and buy sugar and they had water and they made some sugar water and that's what they took to bed with them. Mm. <laughs> and, and people throw food out by the droves. They waste and you know, it's just uh, to me uh, absolutely incredible. It never gets well, easy to listen to stuff like that, eh? Yeah. I would like to. I would like to just ask you, because again, I think that the you've been you've been doing so much work um, on the this Vatican stuff, and yeah. I think it's the what do you call it? The uh, I oh the International see. Tribunal to Crimes of Church and State. Yeah. Yes. Don't you just want to? I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but don't you want to just uh, give people a quick rundown on what is going on there? Because, you know, if this video goes, if this thing goes out, then at least it incorporates the work you're doing as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> the International Tribunal to Crimes of the Church and State um, is basically um, run through the Common Law Courts of Justice, the International Common Law Courts of Justice, which was set up by my very dear friend, Reverend Kevin D. Annett who has basically exposed the church from the inside, himself being, you know, clergy and having experienced the worst of church yes. corruption. I mean, you know what you said earlier about some people going to government genuinely want to make a difference. This is a man who had a spiritual calling. He went into the church wanting to make a difference. And same as a lot of doctors 
who have a natural inclination to be healers and pharmaceutical medication is the only way they find to to fulfill that you know they don't find the natural path there's so many of us with such good intentions not all priests and all rapists but a good example kevin Annett is exposed to church from the inside he has got so qualified with all his degrees and he's been stripped of all of them by the by the vatican but with this he's got an education far enough to actually bring together a court case and look at all the evidence regards to the genocide in canada which he's exposed single-handedly on an international scale um, and he will be here um, in mid-May, and he is helping me put together the case for genocide in Africa. Uh, the causes, the Sutus, the Boers, the Nama, the Herrera, all the major genocides, we're going to take the evidence and put it before the International Tribunal. And we are, in fact, looking for volunteer citizen jurors to look through all the evidence. I mean, it's a lot. It's, I think, probably a thousand pieces, so it's no small task. But I will be putting out an advert for volunteer citizen jurors. I was a volunteer citizen juror in Kevin Annick's first case for Canada. So I know what it entails if anybody wants some information and advice on that. But um, this case, I'll be running, I'll be basically be being the prosecuting party as Kevin was on behalf of Canada. I'll be doing this on behalf of South Africa and running it through the ITCC here in Brussels. Wow, that is, that is phenomenal. And uh, how can people learn more about that? Well... And there is so much work. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly putting out bits and pieces about it. Um, but the most important thing to do is just check out the website, which, of course, is rtccs.org. And that is um, the website with all the information about the International Tribunal to Crime to the Church and State. And then um, we, um, we actually built a little... As when I say we, Freedom Central, myself and my husband have a little web building company that keeps us going. We built, Kevin, a little... Uh, addition to that website called itccs.tv which was um, a unique independent TV channel that accompanies the .org website because YouTube kept deleting the court proceedings okay so uh. we, had to bring, we built in a separate independent channel so that is there attached to the website uh, so we've got a completely in a separate channel completely independent of YouTube for the airing of all the proceedings that we will be doing for South Africa so it's there for everyone to view and just just keep up with it that's all I can say it will go fast um, but it's all there everyone can view the evidence online it's completely open it's completely transparent um, completely transparent process and we advise we ask the world to have a look and anybody who wants to get involved as a citizen juror, I will obviously swear them in, record it, swear them in, um, and then I will be sending through instructions and getting people to look at the various bits and pieces of information over time. And when the date comes for the verdict, I'll get everyone to send in their verdict, and then we film it, put it online, and then it's up to the people to enforce whatever verdict is, is, is drawn. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, then I can just uh, tell people, note the media control. YouTube delete things that they don't want you to know about. Yeah. Um, the government, now that they've received my letters, have had links deleted through major media channels, Forbes, Guardian, Guardian and uh, Mail, and various other places. The Universal Postal Union have removed a link showing their collusion with the United Nations. Um, I, I thank you, Mel, because um, if people out there that are now listening to this can just realize if what I am doing doesn't excite you, you might find that what Mel is doing excites you, <laughs> so join her cause. <laughs> Do you know what? It's not my cause or a cause. But, and let me let me just say, so the problem I have found with this whole freedom movement thing is there have been too many different fronts. The, we, what I love, the thing to me about the OPPT, the most valuable thing, if nothing else, is how many of these beautiful people are brought together. I mean, Anthea, Michael, Scott, all of us come together in that discussion forum the other day. How wonderful was that? Just bringing all the freedom friends together is the most important thing because it's not my cause. It's our cause ultimately the, the the my freedom is tied up in the freedom of the planet which is tied in with everybody else i stand corrected <laughs> <laughs> no from no again i love it i love it that you want to make me own this whole thing but gee whiz i can't take ownership of it it's uh, it's too big it's too big a responsibility and it wouldn't be fair because you know there's been so many people 
so many beautiful people have contributed to this and it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. So yeah, thank you for being a part of it, Sid. That's probably just not phrase well, it's a pleasure, Val. It's just that uh, I suppose that there are certain there are certain things that excite people more yeah. than other things. <laughs> and I'm I'm just hoping that even if people aren't very excited by my thing, they're excited by your thing. Okay. Well, I put you know that film I put out really should get people excited because it's controversial, hey? That sure. that should get people going, and it's it's getting around seven. And as I said, uh, almost a thousand uh, views a day for the first week. I couldn't ask for any more than that for a South African themed film. I mean, wow! So let's just keep the message and the love flowing, and hopefully, people will eventually all catch up and catch on. Well, I've been I've been saying, I, I've been copying yours onto other people's uh, computers with flash and telling them they have to look at it. They South Africa. It's for it's. It's a real history, <laughs> not history as uh, beholden by the, the winners of the last war, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, let's, uh, let's end the source. So thank you very much for your chat. Um, and we'll catch up again soon. Okay, well, thanks All right. a lot. Eh? All right, you're welcome. Take care, hey. Uh, Cheers, Bye. Okay, cheers.